Okay, hi everybody, this is a short introduction to uncertainties at advanced higher physics level. And this goes into a bit more detail than what you did if you did higher physics. But before we start, a little quote from Walter Lewin, professor at MIT. Any measurement that you make without any knowledge of the uncertainty is meaningless. I will repeat this. I want you to hear it tonight at 3 o'clock when you wake up. Any measurement that you make without a knowledge of its uncertainty is completely meaningless. So uncertainties in advanced higher physics are pretty important. And what we mean by that is uncertainties in our raw measurements that we make. And there are three types of uncertainty that you need to be familiar with. The first one which wasn't in higher physics, so this will be new to you, is the calibration uncertainty in your measuring apparatus. Now, usually you're told that in the manufacturer's data sheet or in the user guide, but if you can't find it, then a good estimate of the calibration uncertainty is plus or minus half a percent. So if no calibration uncertainty is available, you can take it to be 0.5% and then hopefully you'll be able to ignore that when you compare it to some of your other uncertainties. The second type of uncertainty you should be familiar with from higher is the scale reading uncertainty in your measuring equipment. And that depends on the type of scale that you're using. So if it's a digital scale, then your reading uncertainty is plus or minus one of your least significant digit. On an analog scale, like a ruler, it'll be plus or minus half of the smallest division, and that's the same as it was in higher physics. And the third one is the random uncertainty in the mean. This is the same as you met in higher physics. And typically in an advanced higher physics experiment, you should be repeating your measurements a minimum of five times, and then working out the random uncertainty in the mean using that same relationship that was on your higher relationship sheet. It's the maximum value minus the minimum value divided by the number of readings that you took. Now typically on an experiment you'll be measuring different quantities and you'll have to combine the uncertainties in those quantities in order to establish a relationship or work out some constant value. So multiple uncertainties may have to be combined and the simplest way to do that is the same as we did in higher physics and that is to work out all your uncertainties as percentages. And then at higher physics, what we did was we just picked the quantity with the largest percentage uncertainty, and that was the percentage uncertainty in our final calculated value. At advanced higher level, we need a more robust treatment of uncertainties so that we can have more confidence in our final results. So, firstly, if any quantity has an uncertainty less than a third of all the others, we can ignore it. And if a quantity is squared in a relationship, its percentage uncertainty is doubled. And the reason for that is that the effect of that uncertainty is appearing twice in the same relationship. And a similar treatment is given to any quantities that are square rooted in a relationship, then the percentage uncertainty would be halved. And a similar treatment is given to any quantities that are raised to any particular power. So the big difference between higher and advanced higher physics is how we combine our uncertainties. And the uncertainty in a final calculated value then is given by this relationship. Looks pretty tricky, but all you're actually doing is you're taking your percentage uncertainties in your individual measurements, you're squaring them and adding them together and then square rooting the result of that. Sometimes it's called the Pythagorean method. We're probably better showing you this by doing an example. So let's use the example of the experiment to find acceleration due to gravity by dropping a ball. So a student drops a ball from a height of two meters, measures how long it takes to reach the floor. They repeat this five times and they measure the height with a tape measure that's got centimeter divisions on it. And they measure the time on a digital centisecond timer. That's a timer that reads to the nearest hundredth of a second. And to determine the acceleration due to gravity on Earth, we are going to use the relationship that you met at higher physics 
That's s equals ut plus a half at squared. And there's our students, 5 times for the ball to fall through a height of 2 metres. So we're going to use the students' measurements of height and time to determine the value for acceleration due to gravity on Earth with its absolute uncertainty. And bear in mind that we're going to take into consideration the three types of uncertainty. So firstly, the calibration uncertainty in our measuring equipment. Well, the tape measure, we don't know what the calibration uncertainty is, but we can take it to be half a percent. The scale reading uncertainty in the tape is plus or minus half a division. Our divisions are centimetres, so the scale reading uncertainty will be plus or minus half a centimetre. And in our two metre height then, two metres plus or minus half a centimetre, is an uncertainty of 0.25 per cent. Now there was no need for us to repeat the measurements of height, so there's no random uncertainty in the height measurement. So these are our only two uncertainties, and we should combine these in the method that we mentioned before. So you take the percentage uncertainties, square them, add them together, and then square root the answer. And that gives us an overall percentage uncertainty in our height measurement of 0.6%. We're going to do the same with the time measurements. So our calibration uncertainty in the stop clock, again, we're going to take it to be half a percent. The scale reading uncertainty in all our times is a hundredth of a second, because that's the least significant bit on our timer. And if we just use the first of our times, then the scale reading uncertainty will be 0.64 plus or minus one hundredth of a second. It gives us a percentage uncertainty of 1.6%. Now we could combine both of these to give us our overall percentage uncertainty in our first time measurement. So that would be the 0.5% squared plus 1.6% squared. All square root gives us 1.7%. Now already this is getting a bit unwieldy because you would really need to do this for all your individual time measurements. But most of the time you won't have to do this at all because your random uncertainty in the mean will be the dominant uncertainty, and all the rest can be ignored. I'll show you what we mean. Here's our time measurements. And the mean of all of these values is 0 0.67 seconds. And the random uncertainty in the mean is the biggest one minus the smallest one divided by the number of readings. And that gives us 0 0.054 seconds. And if we work out that as a percentage, then the uncertainty in the mean time is 7%. Now, 7% is way more than three times bigger than our calibration uncertainty and our scale reading uncertainty, so all the others can be ignored. And because it's t squared in our relationship to work out acceleration due to gravity, we have to double the 7%. That makes it a 14% uncertainty in our calculation of g. So let's do that now, bearing in mind that u, the initial velocity, will be equal to zero, and a in this equation is equal to our acceleration due to gravity. It's g that we're looking for, so rearranging for g, then g is equal to two s over t squared. S was our height of two meters, and our mean time, 0 0.67 seconds. Now that gives us a calculated value of g, of 8.9 meters per second squared, and the uncertainty in that is going to be 14%, because the dominant uncertainty is the uncertainty in the time, which was 7%, it's t squared in the relationship, so we double the 7% to 14%. So in conclusion, our calculated value of g is lower than expected, but the actual value of 9.8 meters per second squared lies within our uncertainty range. And if you take plus or minus 14% of 8.9, then that range is 7.7 .7 up to 10.1. And our value is probably lower than expected due to air resistance or human reaction time. But most importantly, our result is not very accurate and it's not very precise. Our results could be improved by eliminating reaction time from the procedure by using some form of electronic timing or light gates, or by carrying out a graphical procedure.
And what that means is changing the experiment so that we can take a range of results that would allow us to draw a graph and use the gradient of the graph to determine g. Now, if you're doing a graphical method, the best thing to do is to use Excel. It will make your life so much easier because all you have to do is put your results into a blank spreadsheet and get Excel to insert an XY scatter graph. Excel can then draw the best fit line and more importantly, display the equation of the line on the graph, which will show you what your gradient is and the y-intercept. Now, the y-intercept is important because this is the only way that you will see if there is a systematic uncertainty in your procedure. Now, a systematic uncertainty isn't an uncertainty in your individual measurements. It's an error in your system or your setup of the apparatus that affects all your measurements by the same amount in the same direction. And the final thing that Excel can do at the touch of a button is it can work out the uncertainty in your gradient and the uncertainty in your y-intercept by using the linest function that's in Excel. So let's alter our procedure so that we can get a range of results that will allow us to plot a graph and work out the acceleration due to gravity from the gradient of that graph. So here's the procedure here. So a ball is dropped from one, two, three, and four meters, and the time for the ball to reach the ground is measured five times at each height. And the process results are then plotted on a graph, and G is determined from the gradient of that graph. We're still going to use the equation S equals UT plus a half AT squared. And remember, U will be equal to zero because the ball is dropped from rest, and A is equal to acceleration due to gravity. So that relationship simplifies to S equals a half GT squared. And if we rearrange for G, then G equals 2S over T squared. So if we draw a graph with 2S on the Y axis and T squared on the X axis, then the gradient of the graph will be equal to, remember gradient is the change in the Y axis over the change in the X axis. So if we've got 2S on our Y axis and T squared on our X axis, then that gradient will be equal to acceleration due to gravity. Right, here's my results then. Remember we've let the ball fall from four different heights. One meter, two meters, three meters, four meters. And we have timed how long it took to reach the ground five times at each height. We've worked out the mean time at each height. And there's our four heights there. One meter, two meter, three meter, four meters. And we're going to get XL to draw a graph of... Now, we want 2s on the y-axis and t squared on the x-axis. Remember, our relationship for working out g is 2s over t squared. So, we're going to double all our heights, and we're going to take all our mean time values, and we're going to square them. These are all the mean times here, and... I'm going to put another column in Excel and get Excel to work out what T squared is. Now, it's these last two columns here, then, that we want to plot a graph of. We want 2S on the Y-axis, T squared on the X-axis, and there's the graph that we get. Now, Excel not only draws the best fit line, it also displays the equation of the line in the form of Y equals MX plus C. So, as you can see from our graph here, M, the gradient of the line, is 9.77, which rounds to 9.8 metres per second squared. Looks good. We also have the y-intercept. That's the systematic uncertainty. The graph should go through the origin because when S is zero, then T should be zero. But the graph doesn't go through the origin. We've got a y-intercept of 0 0.13. And we'll look at the reasons for that in a wee minute. But before we do... Excel's got a very powerful function built into it, and it lets us work out the uncertainty in the gradient. Remember, our gradient is our value for g. It's 9.77. And using the linest function in Excel, we can work out what the uncertainty in that gradient is. And there it's there. It's 0 0.14. And if we work out that 
as a percentage, then 9.77 plus or minus 0.14 turns out to be a percentage uncertainty of 1.4%, which is far more precise than our previous way of doing the experiment. Now, if you want more detail or if you want a little walkthrough on how to do graphs using Excel and display the equation in the line and work out the gradient and use the line est function, then I have a series of three videos that show you how to do that using the example of the pendulum experiment to work out acceleration due to gravity. Anyway, there's a link in the description to those videos if you want a little bit of extra help with Excel. Now, finally, what about this y-intercept then? We were expecting our graph to go through the origin, but it doesn't. So this points to a systematic uncertainty. So let's look a bit closer at what we actually did to see if we can figure out where this systematic uncertainty is. Well, when we dropped the ball, the top of the ball was at the 2 metre mark. And when it hit the ground, it's the bottom of the ball that hits the ground. So, this is our systematic uncertainty. Or you could say this is the error in our experimental procedure. All our height measurements are going to be out by the diameter of the ball. Now, that diameter was 6.5 centimetres. Now, if we've got 2s on our y-axis, then 2 times the diameter of the ball is 13 centimetres. So all our values on the y-axis, those 2s values, they're all too high by 13 centimetres. We should have dropped the ball with the bottom of the ball at the measured initial height markers. And it's this systematic uncertainty that only shows up when we do a graphical procedure. So by modifying your experimental procedures and taking a range of results that allows you to plot a graph, then you can get a result that's more accurate because it's closer to the known value and it's more precise because it has a lower percentage uncertainty. There we go then. Any measurement that you make without a knowledge of its uncertainty is completely meaningless.